Hey there, everybody. Welcome in to uh, Reaper's Underground. Um, I am filling in. I have been filling in for Reaper today. And we have the one and only Josh Elmore. Paddle decapitate us all the way from Berlin. He's staying up late for us. And then we also have Nick Turner from just, I think, Imperial Beach, just San Diego. And he is with like a causal intrusion and several other bands. So I just wanted to welcome everyone. Uh, Josh, are you good? Here? Yeah, I just got audio. For some reason, it bypassed, but I'm good now. Okay, great, excellent. I can tell. I can see confusion. Oh, like... So uh, Nick will hop back in. in a yeah, there we go. So, so what we're going to do today? The topic for discussion, and I could not have found better men than Josh and Nick for this. We are talking about the avant-garde of metal. And so what I'm hoping to do today is we're going to kind of talk a little bit. I want to define a little bit what is or what does the avant-garde of metal mean to both of you two. And then I want to discuss a little bit uh, about the history. What were the, who were the big influencers? Was it Jazz? Was it, you know, Rush? Was it Kappa? Back in the 60s, 70s, moving up, and then as we get into the 80s, we were going to touch on band, maybe talk about that, and then get into where we are with the bands that are really pushing limits and uh, and doing something really fresh in there. So, Josh, why don't you start off with uh, talk about what you is the avant garde? You hear that? What do you think? I think that term has kind of evolved definitely over uh, the course of the genre's history. I mean, you know, starting out, it was basically just heavier blues based music, you know, and then it maybe took until I'd say maybe the later seventies to where you had some of these, or maybe mid late seventies where you had some of these prog bands that were either having this sort of influence on traditional metal or, uh, you know, it was seeping in through some way to where then you got like, bands that at the time were called metal, but obviously by today's standards, like, I'm going to throw Zebra. Do you remember Zebra? No, that's new. You don't. Okay. It was kind of like a, it was one of those bands that like had this sort of grandiose themes and this, you know, ridiculous artwork. And there was a chess piece and a rainbow and all this, you know, the, on the covers <laughs> of their records to where it was like, if you hear it now, it's kind of like this sort of, oh, this bit, uh, stoner uncle fantasy kind of music <laughs> but i think that was where it kind of seeped in you know there's these hard rock bands that like had this sort of progressive element and then uh punk rock coming in the late 70s too i think those things all kind of came together as it went into the 80s and thrash came around all these things come together there were these varying levels of proficiency of the musicians to where like i don't know i think i remember it was like a hard times sort of article like from a couple years ago that says <laughs> this is the title of something like guitarist either has no idea what he's doing or is the most incredible guitar player you've ever seen you know one of those kind of things and i think there was a lot of that happening um, <laughs> yeah, like post-punk into thrash into uh you know like even some of the art bands like new york stuff like swans and Perry ubu and all that um that kind of all fused together to be these influences that really all of a sudden affected metal in a way to where it avant-garde um, avant it didn't have to necessarily mean like well prog but no issue. i mean it could mean that it just seemed to be like you had all these differing levels of proficiency and people with just the desire to push forward 
to where it does harken back to that article title. Like this guy or person may have not the slightest idea what they're doing, but that's kind of the beauty of it. So there isn't necessarily a technical discipline that's like impressive in a way that like a school class, a trained musician to be like this guy. But at the same time, it's blowing people's minds because you're like, who would do this or that, you know? And is this a song even, you know, or whatever. And I, I think like this is a healthy mixture of absolute ignorance and drive that somehow distills down into this like uh, honed ineptitude <laughs> that just turns out coming, to, you know, ends up turning out so good. It's, it's a shame sometimes because the bands sometimes evolve and be a lot better at their instruments. And then it's like, it, 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 better in a conventional way. I mean, there's plenty of people who have like, you know, gotten better and just stayed true and just are still blowing minds with what they're doing. But I, I think throughout the history of metal, it's just, that's, I think the constant, you know, is this sort of desire to push forward with whatever minimal tools you have technically. And then you just get out there and do it. And however it shakes out, it shakes out. And sometimes there's genius stuff and sometimes there's stuff you put on and go, you hear that? <laughs> okay. Let's, let's, you want to go get something to eat? Okay. Let's get something to eat. You know, it's kind of like that. <laughs> so I don't know. That's probably nonsense, but I think you get what I was saying. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Um, Nick, how about you? What do you sense on this? Well, yeah, John, I think you're kind of like honing in on that difference between prog and avant-garde. You know, whereas prog is is influencing from many genres and pushing forward through technicality and complex compositions, whereas avant-garde is using some of that but just kind of doing whatever the fuck we want and maybe not having the technical ability even sometimes but still going for it. You know, like, I came up with this thing. I can barely play it. I don't know how it's going to sound. I don't know how, but I'm still just doing it, you know? And I, I'm just, yeah, how we all write, all three of us, I'm sure, you know, and that's some of the beauty of, of metal in that we have some of the most open templates to kind of just throw shit at a wall and see what sticks, you know. Um, pretty early on, metal started breaking the verse, chorus, you know, um, you know, structure and just kind of was, became very riff driven, being such a guitar driven genre. So it allows us to just come up with these bizarre riffs. Sometimes they're not melodic in the slightest. They're just shapes that we're uh, visualizing almost from mm -hmm. a visual standpoint. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're just strange noises we figure out how to do and intersperse with the riff. And then the songwriting comes and how do we blend that into a song and make it a cohesive story? You know, where it's not herky jerky or, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't make, like it has to make sense as a, as a composition, you know, and that's the beauty of avant-garde. Either it's really fucking good or it's really fucking bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> there's really either you succeed or you fail. You know, there's no mediocrity, you know, um, there's no cookie cutter. There's no, Oh, that was a decent, you know, little death metal EP. There's none of that. You know, it's just kind of either you did it or you did it. And, mm -hmm. and it's okay if to not do it also, because at least you try, you know what I mean? I feel I've failed on certain albums and I've beyond succeeded on certain albums, you know, but I think the avant-garde is really that never being okay with the status quo, just always having to push forward and even having that dissatisfaction with an album I just clicked release on because I've already gone beyond that. I'm already trying to do something way beyond that, you know, and, you know, and it's really, I'm only satisfied. Sometimes I'll go back, listen to shit I did four or five years ago, I'm like, damn, I was actually good back then. I don't know what happened. <laughs> you know, but I think I need a significant period of time to take, you know, to pass between a work before I can look at it objectively again and really oh, see yeah. the good things because in the moment it's that it's that addiction. It's that striving for something new, something different. And um growing up and really getting into guitar I found that in bands like uh, King Crimson, you know, who really, I think, started this whole kind of avant-garde and metal thing. Uh, I mean, it really kind of all goes back to that, even though it's prog rock or hard rock or 
it had this evil evilness to a lot of it yeah. that um to me that's what makes something metal it's not the gain or the distortion or mm -hmm. the blast beats it's this kind of sinister tone you know uh-oh uh-oh reconnect uh -oh. well he'll be back pretty soon mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, well, um, a, a point that I wanted to bring up is a lot of times, and I'm not an outstanding technical guitar player. I can play, I can get by, I can do both, oh, yeah. a lot of stuff. But, you know, a lot of times I've found there's somebody who's been to guitar school and they're a guitar wanker. They can do all kinds of stuff, but when it comes to writing something that's catchy or something that sounds really new, they're too technical and too kind of sterile. Nothing seems raw and fresh with what they're doing a, a lot of the times. Yeah, I, I definitely can see that. That's the thing is, I think, with uh, how uh, modern recording is, too, um, which, I mean, uh, the past, I don't know how many albums I've done are done exactly that way, but uh, I'm not condemning or poo-pooing that. It's more just like, it's almost make it as tight as you can sound, but with a human element to it. So it's nothing's going to be perfect. It's, yeah. it's, but I mean, there's people that could like listen to our rec cattle records and be like, Oh, that's way too sterile. That's way too tight and fixed or stuff. And it's just like, well, that's no, all of us playing all that stuff, you know? Yeah. Of course, recorded separately with, you know, piece by piece, but it's, yeah, it's all, it's all us and stuff like that. But I totally see what you're saying. Like, I mean, I, there's a lot of the, like guitar players I would look up to that, yeah, are incredibly talented, but it's not in a conventional way. It's not in a sort of guitar center, you know, eight finger tapping way. It's yeah. more just super creative, maybe super technical, but not in a manner that's uh, whatever the metric is current, the current metric for that. You know? Right. Yeah. Sorry. I don't, my browser randomly updated and booted me off, but I need it back in here. <laughs> Well, welcome back. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, just going back to the King Crimson thing, I really think that's where it started. And, you know, these bizarre guitar patterns, you know, right. it was some of the first stuff I heard as a kid that kind of blew my mind, you know. And then going back, just that dissonance really stuck out to me. Rather than the, the shredding or the Ying Wei stuff or the tapping, you know, that still all made sense musically to me mm -hmm. that it's just kind of scales or modes or neoclassical type shit. But uh, hearing shit that broke what I knew of music theory and just shattered it into a million pieces, that's what I was interested in. You know, and how to make these horrible sounding things that actually mm -hmm. sound phenomenal. You know, to me, mm -hmm. they do. I, not, yeah. I know not to everyone they do, but I think that's what unites us in avant-garde metal is that these you know really terrible sounding things uh actually intrigue us and mm -hmm. sound amazing to us you know yeah they're they're these a lot of times like what i think of when i hear the band uh, it's it's intentional it's very intentional and so i've there have been some reviews on vitriol album uh, and, listen to it. and it's like they don't get it that this is the, what vitriol is doing is exactly what they've intended to do. It's really in your face, dissonant at times, really, really bizarre stuff. The riffs don't stand out. They're not groovy or as uh, it might be in other forms of metal. But I would argue, if, guys, and I'm, I'm probably going to have to drop soon, that's what they're in. It sound exactly what they sound oh, yeah. right. We're, by the way, reviewing Vitriol's album tomorrow, uh, the new album. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I think it's exactly what that. I mean, we, we actually toured with them a few years ago, I think 2019, 2018. And then uh, we'll actually be touring with them again in uh, this upcoming May for the Chaos and Carnage thing. Yeah. But uh, it's, yeah, it's all very intentional. There's no, like, just flying it in to see what happens. It's, they're... they're super intense and i mean mm -hmm. it's it's like you said it's not i mean yeah there's riffs in the conventional sense there but there's it's it's like a slurry of texture because it's so yeah. just a tense attack and just a lot of just like you know slurring and stuff like that and it's it su succeeds you know at exactly what it's trying to do right 
Uh, I, I want to acknowledge uh, Kyler uh, gave me a pick at the show in May, Josh. And Ky Kyler's was, uh, he's really, he's been looking forward to this show a long time. And then we have a, a, a my friend out of Austin, uh, she, by uh, Mouse, and he follows us quite a bit into a causal and cattle decapitation mm -hmm. bands that are really pushing metal so she, she, as well so yeah i think is a great one that i didn't think when i ran up that's outstanding when i listen watch old napalm death videos and they're like from the talking about the and king crimson was one of their big ones. I would argue that Napalm Death, all the way, although in a, I mean, they were unconventional, really short songs and and the the grind element to it, but um, not the not technical and not really weird to me, uh, especially in today's sense, not pioneering. But I would still call them like they were the avant garde at, at a time. Like I, I really wanted all everybody. Have you heard of Napalm Death? And, mm -hmm. But in a different sense of the way. But, but what got to me, you know, if I think about Frank Zappa, like the band Robert Patterson may have gone back and looked at what Frank Zappa and time changes. Rush, I know Robert likes Getty Lee and his bass is really prominent and similar as uh, Getty Lee is. Um, but then like me, there were a couple of bands in the late 80s that I thought really kind of opened things up. It was Godflesh in the street. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And the other one was Atheist, but the Peace of Time album. And, and I'm showing these so people can go find these CDs. Get them. These are albums. Mm -hmm. right. Peace of Time and Questionable no Presence. That's what I'm repping my shirt here today. Mm -hmm. Um. But what, what say you guys, like around, as we're moving into the late 80s, of course, Death had uh, their, uh, uh, Death had had their uh, kind of form of vocal, which was very avant-garde, along with Possessed for a certain extent. But what would you think for Josh? Could you repeat that again? You're kind of dropping out a bit. Uh, oh. Um, like which of the bands, like was it Atheist for you, Godflesh for you, that was really pushing things at the late 80s when Thrash was starting to kind of run for us? Oh, I would say actually uh, uh, Voivod. For me. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nothing Face yes. to this day is like, you know, I, it was one of those that like, my friends were like, oh, Dimension Hantros and all the early Roar and Warren Payne, and it's nothing against those. I just hadn't gotten those records yet. Yeah. And then I didn't get them until later. But then my first one was like, oh, I'll get a Voivod record was Nothing Face. And that's the first one I jumped in on. And me too. That's that's it. And from to today, I can still listen to that all the time and like love it, you know. And that Piggy's guitar style and just mm. how how cold the music sounded and really just sort of like not robotic in a sort of uh, like nowadays, precision tight way, but robotic and it's just like the writing was just sounded very steely and it the music sounded exactly like um, all those panels and the cassette that Away did all the art for. Right. And it's just very steely and futuristic and sort of post apocalyptic dystopian. And I, I just think the entire package and the artwork and then Piggy's guitar playing and everything mm -hmm. that's what really affected me at that time and still does to this day. Oh, that was in a, in a Ex excellent one. I, it's right across in my over there. I mm -hmm. face when it came out. Love it. it. You're right. Piggy's guitar phrasing with his solos and mm -hmm. it, even his riffs. Are mm -hmm. really oh, yeah. And you know, his that guitar that he had, I, hit, I don't know if that was a BP Rich, but that thing got stolen on tour through the, the like luggage at one point. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, the one that was like looked kind of like a looked like a piece of their logo basically. Almost. Yeah. It was this sort of spiky. Yeah, that thing was, it, it was like black with the red pinstripe on it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I really think back in in that era when I go back and listen to all that stuff, everyone was really trying to push it pretty far, whether in their own way, 
there wasn't as many rules or it wasn't as cookie cutter of I'm going to be a thrash band. I'm going to be a, you know, a prog death band. I'm going to be, you know, there wasn't all these sub genres. It was just like, I want to be heavy and do it however I can, you know, and some bands pushed it farther than others, you know, but yeah, showing that with God flesh versus uh, atheists, it's the two sides of zero technicality and wall of sound and creating this, you know, dystopian bleak atmosphere versus high level technicality, you know, but trying to create this totally insane uh, soundscape with these ridiculous riffs that no one else was doing yet. So it's the two sides of the avant-garde when really it's like, instead of, and that's where I go back to the, uh, the distinction of Prague and avant-garde, instead of showing how good I am, I'm going to try to evoke this mood that's never been evoked before. Yeah. You know, uh, and that, that, and the way we do that is through using unconventional notes or, or phrasing or song ideas, you know, that's the way we do it musically. But, uh, um, you know, I think back then everyone was kind of trying to figure it out. And then into the early nineties is when people started putting themselves in little boxes. And then from there, people started rebelling as a result of that. And then we get, Demolich and uh, Gore Guts and all the other yeah. good stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Like a disembowelment in 1993 put out their uh, album, their single album, super hard to find these days, but this is like, it, it, it came out about two years after, mm -hmm. a one year after Cathedral's Bolivium, which I thought was outstanding. And it came like three years before the first two Paradise Lost uh, albums. But what Disembowelment did that was so different is that unconventional atmosphere yeah. grew in there. Amazing fucking album. Like 20 songs of the album and a lot of them were four, six minutes. But if, if you guys I don't have that, that album, you want to send I it? I don't have it, but I've heard it so many times. Just yeah. To me, it's kind of like the pinnacle of if I want to go a death or funeral doom route. Mm -hmm. You know, they just achieved that feeling with those clean guitars and the drowning in reverb and just the the phrasing and choices and the unexpected dropouts into quietness and, uh, you know, the dynamics. They just, no one had really done that yet in a metal realm, you know. And I'm, the first time I... Heard dynamics like that was listening to Slint, Slint's mm -hmm. uh, Spiderland. Oh yeah, and that was a massive influence on me as a young teenager smoking tons of weed. You know, trying mm -hmm. to play in my bands. Hearing that, I'm like, oh, that's what I want to do. You know, I want that intensity, those build ups, those dropouts, those. You know, instead of a song remaining the same shit the whole time, I want. I want those, you know, all of a sudden pull the whole thing out under them and then uh, slowly build that intensity with those crescendos. And it's almost like classical music in a sense, you know, but we miss that in rock and metal sometimes just going full force mm -hmm. and shit loses its heaviness when it's just chug, 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 chug for 45 minutes. I get fucking bored. Personally, mm -hmm. I do, you yeah. know. I need to hear at least an interlude of some weird synthy shit or, a, mm -hmm. you know, a little clean guitar part and then come back in and it feels heavy again, yeah. you know, but when it's the same thing the whole damn time, I, I check out mentally, personally, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So, so I want to bring up a, an album if we need to go back a little bit more, but to me, this album is one that is still timeless even today. And uh, to me, this is the one that really kind of pushed things more than I know. You guys know from other but I'm talking about Akira. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. When I heard this album, oh, my gosh. Because I already loved Atheist. Mm -hmm. So I was like, this is like 10 times even more beyond Atheist. What's it? Okay. Uh, I I got it um, when they were still just on Olympic before Olympic joined to uh, I think it was Century Media or whatever they got absorbed by. 
uh, this guy Marty uh, was part of Olympic. And it's his label, and they were based out of, I think, I want to say Elgin, Illinois. Mm. And I was living in Chicago area at the time. So the sort of just the digipack, of, or not digipack, but just with a cover and the CD in a little plastic case uh, appeared to my buddy's distro. And I'm like, yoink, you know, because I at that point, I hadn't heard them yet. That was the first time I was, I'd heard Burgos, uh, uh-huh. strangely enough. And then, like, I, uh, it's not that I d- didn't know what to make of it. Right? It was just more like, because at that, at that point in time in my life, it was like, metal had become, you know, kind of, I don't know, I was kind of come and go with it, you know, but then that kind of, that and a couple other events at the time kind of brought me right back. Yeah. I, I heard that and I was just like, this is, obviously these guys are not just uh, doing the normal nine to five death metal thing, you know? So I was super impressed, you know, like technically, and then just some of the ideas for the riffs were just like, just played just, it, it was just incredibly calculated, but played in such a way that it was sound like the wheels were going to fall off at any given time. Like there was just, just like, they were just hanging on, but it's beautiful that way. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Like Nick, Nick, Nick and I were talking before about especially this album, and Nick, Nick has done this with his recent albums. Like it's like the game all the way back to one, but really intense mm-hmm. all over the place. Well, and that's what, you know, kind of uh, why I said earlier, metal is not about the level of gain or the loudness. It's about that kind of evilness and that intensity. And, and pushing these boundaries that no other music's willing to do. And you know, that's what Gorguts really did with that album. And they really opened the entire realm of the, you know, Disso Death or the Avant Garde or Disso Black Metal, you know. And without them, there would be no Death Spell Omega and there'd be none of the modern bands. And, you know, it really just opened the whole door of what we're capable of in the genre. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a lot younger than you guys, and I, admit, you know, I fucked off a good decade of my life uh, being crazy and stupid and, and uh, finally pulled my head out of my ass and got back into music. So, you know, I've been blessed to have work with a lot of older, experienced people who educated me on all this stuff. But, um, yeah, and they knew my style already, how I play. They knew exactly what to show me, which was Gorguts mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, Demolich and disembowelment all the bands we've spoken of are the mm-hmm. things they showed me because they saw the potential in me to be able to do all this stuff yeah. you know when most of the local musician kind of cookie cutter guys can't even try to go there you know or aren't, aren't able to open their minds to that you know i was already uh, playing all sorts of way out shit and i just hearing all that is like adding to our vocabulary you mm-hmm. know learning new words Learning new words to write with, learning new sentence structures, learning new languages even when you get down to the Gorgut shit of these weird pick <laughs> scrapes and sliding yeah. shit. And, mm-hmm. You know, they're just doing tricks, but orchestrating it in this like psychotic manner and playing in the most wild time signatures. I doubt they had any idea what time signatures they were playing in at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They just said, no, I came up with this thing. And it's, you know. And it's mm-hmm. like 15 to 8 or something, you know. Uh, and But they don't know that. They're just jamming it and, and getting tight, you know. But that's what makes it so great. There's mm-hmm. no metronome. There's no, uh, you know, click track. There's no editing. They just have to fucking hammer that shit out until it's tight as fuck. And that's that's what I love. Yep, I, I agree, Mouse Fong. Gorguts are pioneers. I think we all concur with that. That album, especially Obscure, is outstanding. I saw Gorguts in like 92 when they were just straight death metal and mm-hmm. considered dead album. I had the teacher album, but I, I wasn't. But when I heard Obscure, I was like, oh, <clears throat> anything like Gorguts. Just outstanding. But Nick, Nick, you brought up a band that I want to talk about now. And both of you guys in um, in Cattle Decapitation, even in Terracite, the, the recent album, black metal is throughout it. In A Causal Intrusion, I hear black metal in there. The vocals might be Cave Monster for Causal Intrusion, 
but you black metal element there quite a bit. It leads me a lot to Death Spell Omega Heraclitus uh, quite a bit. Fucking love this. This is another one, you guys, if you haven't, if you're really into avant-garde, you want to try something new, try out uh, Death Spell Heraclitus. When I heard these guys, nobody was doing black metal. And one of the big so I like to talk about, talk about black metal. Black metal board these days. There's like thousands and thousands of bands. Now, the new Marduk this, this year, last year, I thought it was outstanding, really well done. The Watain album that came two years ago was outstanding black metal, really, really well done black metal. But I'm pretty bored, like, I have a hard time. Maybe I'm just, I have a hard time with the newer black metal bands. They're not doing something different. But Death Spell really does. So maybe you guys can take that and for some discussion. Well, another band I heard that kind of blew my mind who's way older is uh, Bad Blends End. Or I don't know quite how to say it, but yep. those clean those clean vocals and uh, clean guitar passages and just completely bizarre riffing. And uh, just the, the mixture of those depressed operatic vocals and the black metal vocals and the interludes and the instrumentation i mean i just fucking i i found it on my buddy had it on vinyl and sold it to me i needed it you mm -hmm. know and uh you know that's another band that goes back to what black metal is capable of yeah. you know which black metal probably even has a farther reach than uh death metal because you know of what it's capable of because oh, yeah. it's really no no rules really at all other than a, a depressive or evil atmosphere you know, and it can be taken. You don't even need guitars. There's, you know, synth-driven stuff and everything. So, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, for me, it's very hard to just do one thing. You know, I always am gonna pull. I view just kind of music as this big platter of all-you-can-eat buffet, and I'm gonna take what I like and put it on the plate. You know, um, but obviously that differs for each project what I want to get across, but. It's gonna be real fucking hard for me just to say I'm gonna do a cookie cutter death metal thing. That's gonna be really <laughs> best believe I'm throwing something weird in there because I just can't help myself. You know, I'm a I'm that kid in the candy shop that can't help myself. Um, but yeah, Death Spell Omega, Par Paracletus. That's my favorite from them. And um, as far as modern black metal, I mean, I just kind of have to dig through the weird random demos that come out, and sometimes I find something gold. As far as mainstream or overproduced stuff, I just stay, stay clear of it. Yeah. I know Josh, your band can quite a bit producing, per, perusing and finding new bands. Oh, yeah. There's there's a couple, like a YouTube channel that's, I don't even remember the name off the top of my head, so this is going to be useless to suggest because it's this giant, it's like a really long German word, so it's, you know, this compound thing. But it's basically... It dungeon synth black metal mixed with like a bunch of demos from international bands yeah. and then and then um varying levels of some very traditional second wave black metal uh and then some stuff that's just like kind of what i just got or like i mentioned before it's like the production is so like what are they doing like <laughs> I mean, not that you know i'm basically just barely able to comprehend band camps so i'm not speaking from any sort of like you know level expertise here um but uh or a guitar or a garage band not band camp garage oh. band. um but uh i just it's 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 one of those things unintentionally avant-garde to go back to our original sort of topic there it's just like why would they make this sort of production toys why does the guitar sound like that why does the snare sound like that and it becomes like unintentionally progressive <laughs> because <laughs> I don't know if anyone would make these choices like later, but it's kind of beautiful. So I like, I, you know, I get you know, on my YouTube, like suggested listening or like, Oh, there's a new, the person who runs that page is constantly putting new stuff up. So it's like, I'll go in and kind of like, okay, listen to a couple songs and like see if it's for me or not, but it's stuff like that. There's so many channels right now that that's one of the beauty as much as I whine about the internet. Um, that's the beauty of like stuff like that. It's just like, it is so endless and so amazing. That it's just like, I can just sample all this stuff. And it's like, 
some of them are like practice recordings of like a one mic probably in the basement which is how yeah myself and a lot of other people started out you know doing stuff yeah. same um, my first album yep yep and then which is strange because it's like i found that a boom box in the center of the room or one mic oftentimes sounded better than that guy down the street that you went into his studio and paid him like 500 bucks right <laughs> right it was like i don't know why it's just like pay this guy it's like this sounds like crap and then why are we paying this guy when there was like literally a panasonic boom box with one speaker that sounds way better than <laughs> you really anyway. can't fuck up a single mic hung up the center no. of the garage no i remember yeah, yeah so the first album i recorded was with me and all my buddies in high school and we were all really good musicians i mean we've been playing our whole life since little kids and taking lessons and everything but we all just dropped a whole bunch of fucking acid and went in there and just went for it. Totally <laughs> improv and strung up a single fucking uh, mic with this little mini disc recorder thing, mm -hmm. you know, like, like $30 at Radio Shack type shit. And dude, I mean, we sobered up and listened to it and it sounded like everything was panned perfectly. Like mm -hmm. you could hear the bass on the left, me mm -hmm. on the guitar on the right. And then the drums sounded perfect. And it was like, what the fuck? And mm -hmm. I've been trying to track that goddamn thing down to put out on my label just as a historical piece, but <laughs> I haven't been able to find it again. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and but then you take that versus someone who's an amateur recording artist and mixer, and they're separating all the tracks, but they have no fucking idea what they're doing. You can totally make it sound worse than that. Oh, yeah. Big time. You know, blowing out the bass on the kick and the mm -hmm. goddamn snare sounds like ass and it's peaking and then mm -hmm. the guitars aren't panned and everything just sounds like fucking mush, you yeah. know, Absolutely. Uh, which goes, yeah, it goes back to the, the black metal bands unintentionally creating a long guard, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think on rare occasions they do do it atten intentionally today to capture oh, yeah. the sound, but mm -hmm. a lot of times when it's some random kids in like uh you know cuba or something just mm -hmm. trying to do this demo they have no idea and uh on, on accident they're clipping certain things and eqing horribly and mm -hmm. it creates but sometimes it works out and creates yeah. this very unique atmosphere yeah, right. absolutely yeah. i want to i want to throw out a band that uh josh toured with uh in 2009 first met josh with like a week or two after the Harvest Floor came out. Mm -hmm. And they were touring with Hyopus. Oh, wait, that's the <laughs> This This Hyopus, this yeah. before, and this yeah. is the other. Mm -hmm. and, it again. and then this. There we go. They were touring, and it is out odd sense. It's standing. Really bizarre stuff. Maybe, Josh, you can talk through these guys because. The guitarist, one hell of a guitarist. Oh, yeah, he's easy. I, I think he actually, his his story, if I remember correctly, is he, you know, he played guitar prior, you know, or just was a guitar player, but he got into a car accident and was injured pretty badly. And I think sometimes, like, part of his recovery or uh, was him being in bed, you know, and just bedridden for a while. So he would just play guitar all day, and then he got a job where he was a attendant in an overnight like parking lot. So mm. he'd have like one customer every <laughs> few hours. So he just sat there and played guitar all day, all night in his little booth. <coughs> <coughs> so he just, you know, practiced intensely all day or all night on his job, and then while he was recovering from his uh, injury, and that kind of gave birth to uh, his technical proficiency, but. He's also extremely creative. You know, it's not just like, you know, the standard, you know, licks or whatever, just executed really well. He's just, everything sounds like, I don't know, like a fax machine, 10 fax machines going at the same time. <laughs> like, it's just like, or the set of ringtones. It's just, if he wants to be, but then he could do some very beautiful standard sounding, you know, just conventionally beautiful uh, guitar playing too. I think actually now he's in a, uh, he's still playing, but I think it's not metal at all. I think it's like, he's, he's from Rochester, New York. I think he's in some sort of, a, I don't want to say a reggae band, but he's in something that's very, very not metal, where it's more like, I show up, wear the tie, play the stuff, go home, have my life, that kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, they, when we toured with them, it was 
you know, you know, of course, all incredible musicians. Um, but just watching him every night, just like do all this stuff and be able to immediately translate from brain to the instrument and not, you know, even when he's just like warming up or just fiddling around and noodling, boom, boom to the instrument. Not like, oh, let me try to work this out. It's just like immediate, you know, uh, call and response. It's pretty incredible to watch. Yeah, when I heard the harvest floor, I reached out to gore guts and some of the things that you with that and then mixing it with black metal. I really like that. It was something that was really fresh. And then of course with Travis's uh, vocals and doing five different types of vocals uh, was just amazing. And to me that was really avant-garde. Different because more a little bit more in the convention for wild like Sayoka uh, was, but it fit together oddly enough. Yeah, I felt that was our kind of, that was, well, that and Karma Bloody Karma, the previous, the record yeah. we were seeing again, were kind of the wild card record, are the wild card records in the catalog. Um, it's like a lot of people that uh, now are fans of the band or came on in post, say, mid 2010s or whatever. Yeah. Um, and people say, oh, go back to the earlier records. You know, it's it's a little more like raw sounding and more grind oriented or less, you know, mm. polished, whatever you want to say. And uh, Harvest War is always the one where they're like, that's the farthest they can go back. <laughs> um, but I think it's a lot on that record, a lot of it's because the production got a lot better. And uh, we got a, you know, we had Dave McGraw drumming on that album, you know, to present. So, so his ability really kind of elevated what we were trying to do. But to, to go speak to what you were saying earlier, um, I, I think it was a kind of a combination of us having Billy Anderson produce that record. Um, that he was very like, you guys do what you guys do. Of course, I'm here for production, cons you know, to be a consultant. That's what I'm also, aside from engineering it. But he really let us go crazy, which in certain instances, he probably should have held us back on some certain things. You know, at least I can speak personally, not for the rest of the guys. But... Um, yeah, I just, I really kind of was able to just dump everything I wanted to do at that time, or had the ability to do, whether that was all scronky stuff or kind of blurry sounding, you know, guitar lines or just really like, what is he doing? <laughs> and the answer is, I don't know. So, uh, yeah. you know, just, just kind of let me able to throw it all out. So, I don't know. I, re I really like that album. I wish we would do more songs off of it <laughs> uh, currently, but, uh, you know, that's another one of those little inner band tussles we uh get into them um, stuff like that so <laughs> yeah hardest part of being in a band is trying to work with everybody yeah you know <laughs> songwriting yeah. easy recording album easy you know playing shows easy but the inner dynamics always been the hardest part yeah in my get, experience <laughs> yeah and making everyone feel heard and valued and working towards mm -hmm. what they want to do mm -hmm. uh not always possible you know and sometimes things need to align to places with the right people, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna... um, but I had something I wanted to say about the Psy Office story. Mm -hmm. I would sit there all night playing his guitar in the overnight job. I think mm -hmm. for a lot of us that end up in the avant-garde realm, we've had some times in our life where we've been kind of isolated from culture or music as a whole and allowed to kind of develop this unique style without too much external influence i know for me personally i've had times <clears throat> you know going through my uh crazy life where i've been locked in rehabs or jails and stuff and i've just had to figure out and i've just kind of had nothing no reference point other than the things i heard in my younger days and just you know pushing boundaries on my own and i was that guy in a sense in that in that booth playing for hours just figuring shit out and developing my own voice, you know? And I think that, I don't know, I'd like to hear your take on that, that if you've had times in your life, you've been kind of cut off from hearing a lot of outside shit and just figuring out your own shit on your own of just what comes from that brain straight out or with that unfiltered thing. For me, I, I would just real quick, just say Ranger school in 90 and it was three months of staying awake almost every day, seven hours a week. So you would be awake all the time. And so whatever were the latest bands that 
that I had got to see these, and I'd listened to them enough. I had that in my head. So I had songs in my head all day. I wasn't to play, but I was thinking about music. Yeah. Songs were strong, things that were going on in there. And like that's the only thing I could relate uh, to that. But it was a time where I was no access, I couldn't even listen to music. I had what was in my head. Right. Yeah. At the time, it had dancing quite a bit, although I had all kinds of death. But uh, right. I, I have those, and it really stuck with me. Yeah. So, Josh, have you been isolated and had. Um, well, I think like when I was first starting out, uh, like as a kid, we got my first guitar and everything like that. I grew up, I grew up on a farm, so I, yeah, I had friends at school and everything like that. One or two of them played guitar, but a lot of it was just uh, me, like, <laughs> like remembering parts of songs I liked or whatever, and then like, oh, I want to write something like that, and then doing it, and of course doing it completely incorrectly. Yeah, and exactly, then, exactly. And then, and like really poorly it was at least imitating what I was trying to do. And then, so it was like, Oh, it's technically original, not intentionally. <laughs> so I was trying to do this. Right. I want to write a riff exactly like that. And I totally screwed up. Happy. But I think also hearing like I, when I was a kid, I was just like, tell my parents to get in the car. I'm like, turn on the radio, turn on the radio, you know? So it was always like whatever FM station, which at the time, this is, you know, was little like that, probably the early eighties, early mid eighties. So it was like top 40 radio. And at that time, hard rock was just kind of becoming a force on radio. So I, I didn't know I was hearing with totality, the band, and I thought somehow, yeah, there's a bass guitar player. Yeah. There's a guitar player, maybe two, but for some reason I'd hear like two guitar players playing one person playing like melody or different voicings. And then the bass player maybe walking around. And I, for some reason thought that was one guitar doing all that. So I think I would try to like imitate that sound or what I yeah. thought I was hearing and I unintentionally like made something way busier than it should have been and way, way harder than it should have been. <laughs> but I think that's where it kind of came out, at least me personally, like some sort of level of originality is because I did actually, I was unable to actually recreate what I was hearing. So the product right. of that was this thing. And that's like, well, here's my riff. And it's like, what the fuck is that? You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. But it's, it's different. Yeah it's, yeah. it's different. You know? instead of sitting and figuring out these tabs of all these bands or yeah. being exposed to every single bit of music uh, all the time, kind of how we are now with the internet and, and we're all so plugged in, but I think developing that voice for me, a lot of it had to do with, you know, I, I knew some stuff I liked, I knew I liked some weird dissonance and everything, but having those times when I had no reference point and I'm just figuring out on my own, hey, that sounds cool. That's something I want to add to my arsenal of choices, you know. Hey, let's try that, you know. Whoa, that's a crazy interval. I've never played that before, and I really like it. And it's kind of building this, um, you know, language template to work with uh, without kind of trying to copycat things that I heard so much, yeah. Yeah. you know. Also, like I – to kind of ex just to extend it real quick on what I was saying before, like – I went to college and after I went through all growing up and high school and everything, I went to college in Chicago, lived there for eight years or so. And at that time, this is, you know, early 90s up through almost uh, to 2000. Um, I was here, all the band, there was so many like more of the indie avant-garde bands, you know, going around, you know, super dissonant, but more like a very like almost 4-4 like rock structure. But the guitar yeah. playing was always really whether it was like saying U.S. Maple or Jesus Lizard or Lake of Dracula right. or some of the Touch and Go bands or whatever. I was hearing that, but I was like going, wow, I really love what they're doing, but I just wish they would just, you know, be really angry yeah. while they were doing it. You know, so I would try to like hear those bands like, and just like, okay, here, I think I see what they're doing chord wise, I think. So I would just do that and just like, we'll just buzz saw through it and make it really annoying and, you know, abrasive. Yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of oh, yeah. I was I felt myself very fortunate to be around in that time because there were so many great bands that I mean that, that I was like I may have not wanted to go to their shows or been like oh, I'm not gonna go see that that's not a grind band that's not whatever yeah or a death, <laughs> death metal I was too too underground cool press whatever yeah. to go to that but I was still like 
you know, I worked at a venue for a while. One of my bandmates was a, pro a promoter and booked one of the better independent venues in the city. So I got to see all those bands, you know, how many times when I was doing door or just doing like gopher stuff and it stuck, you know, and there's still a lot of those bands. I can go back now as someone who isn't going to be so contrarian because it's not blast beats and screaming or whatever yeah. and enjoy now. And I think I've, I've think that's a, a valuable thing I'd like to be able to go back and do. <laughs> right on. Yeah, noise rock is a huge pedestal on the on the, the influences that built me to the player I am. Yeah, the, hearing Jesus Lizard and even math rock stuff, the Don Caballero and Hella and all the weird shit they mm -hmm. were doing. You know, it was more shit that was blowing my mind. And yeah, obviously we're extremists. We want to take it heavier, but it's, I wouldn't be the player I am today without having heard all those bands and, you know, such an important part of my guitar history. Absolutely. Um, I absolutely love all those, uh, uh, all those bands and yeah, create, being able to create a simple four, four structure into something totally bizarre, mm -hmm. you know, just in the weird poly rhythms and the mm -hmm. dissonant little, you know, uh, chords out of nowhere. Um, yeah. So, I think if more metal bands embrace that noise rock, mm -hmm. you know, we could have so much more interesting stuff out there. And Absolutely. luckily we are, um, a lot more bands are starting to today. Yeah. And there's kind of like a small revival going on. Um, we yeah, actually came out with a noise rock uh, record last year called Big Strut is a band name, all one word. And just total noise rock cover of these like, you know, cut out rooster things like kind of strutting around. Um, but um, it was so much fucking fun to just go that route and just do the do the crazy weird rock perspective, mm -hmm. you know. And I had a fucking blast. Right on. That sounds great. Yeah, like we, I see a mouse bong chiming in here and there. Like she real of noise rock, all of the avant garde. You know, like I knew she loved this this episode more than any of the others. I want to ask you. I, I see the learning how to play other people's music technical wise learn how to become technical and improving your craft but for me like i don't like to do that so much because i like to copy other stuff i enjoy being creative it's not something i'm used for an album or i just love being creative stuff when i play well i think the best benefit of hearing and figuring out other people's music is figuring out how they created that sound that I like. What did they do? When I heard this thing, when I heard King Crimson as a kid or whatever, and I wanted to know how he was making that noise, I figured out how to play it. And in that sense, now I knew how to make that noise. Yeah. But I, that doesn't mean I have to do exactly how he did it. Yeah. So really, it's just me. For me, the thing was hearing something special, fresh, and new. And figuring it out so I can steal it and and make it my own, but really it's taking all the things I like from everything and learning that. Um, but yeah, then I have gone down the negative rabbit hole with it of having people hit me up say, "Hey, I want to do X, Y, and Z album, some genre I've never attempted, and listen to it, and it kind of go to copycat because I kind of just learn the genre. Okay, I can easily do that. So that's what I've used it negatively. But when I use it positively, it's learning a tool and how I can use that tool moving forward. Because we can't figure out everything ourselves. All of music's been built on a history of people figuring out new shit. And I hope one day people listen to our shit and steal what they like from it and build mm -hmm. upon that. You know, but um, yeah, to me, it's more rather than transcribing a solo or whatever, it's learning how, what, what technique they use to create a certain uh, atmosphere that I didn't know how to do at that time. Right on. Uh, Ky Kyler has a comment here, and then we'll get Josh if you have something to add. Okay. Uh, ask, how do you get into the zone of coming up with new stuff or embrace the feeling of, of death? Like for, for me, I'm just driven. I just do it. I just want to do it. I can't help it. It's kind of like a drug. Like I have to have that fix for me. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Like I have a, there's a guitar sitting next to the couch in there. Like I, that I just, there's the, it's my fiance's guitar. It's her guitar technically. 
but my other guitar, the one of the Cardinal that you see me playing every time is in the closet over here that I bring out like, okay, I'm going to sit at the, you know, my interface or whatever, or my, like my plugins or whatever. And then that's the serious one. And the other one's just kind of like fiddling around with stuff. And it's like, you know, we were talking about this the other day. It's just like, I'll sit down and I'm just plunking around and yeah, there's the same stuff I kind of play over and over just that I have new wrists that I'm kind of working on or whatever. But then unfortunately it's like, there's always something new that comes out every time yeah. is it great nah, maybe it sucks maybe it's whatever but it's it's something it's like the wheels are turning to you know create something new so it's like even but it's not you know when i sit down like okay i gotta write some new stuff then it's like i'm under pressure if i'm just sitting there like letting it organically come out then that's when i can be actually really productive i find you know so i'm fortunate in the way that like i sit down and usually something comes out and i can you know take it or leave it later but yeah it's this constant you know uh you know, it's just in you to complete, to just like always come up with new stuff or have something that's going to be interesting for that day that you can work on and evolve in that little piece to maybe apply to, you know, nothing at all, or just to happen to enjoy or apply to a song you want to write for whatever project you're working on. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. My kind of rule of thumb is if I still remember the riff the next day, it's good yeah. enough. You yeah. know, Mm -hmm. I'm not transcribing it. I'm not writing it down. A lot of times I'm not even scratch recording it, but you know, mm -hmm. I know when something feels good to play and mm -hmm. you know, you feel it inside you. It's mm -hmm. not an intellectual thing. It's like maybe intellectually I get there by trying some new phrasings, but when it feels fucking good, it feels fucking good. And that's rock and roll. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And yep. that's metal. And uh, if I wake up the next day or, or after two days, if I get busy and can't play, and I still remember it right away. I know that that's that's worth my fucking yeah. time, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, for me, I'm working on so much shit that I kind of have to get in the mindset of each project I'm working on. So mm -hmm. you know, if I'm doing a certain thing, which is my double bass weird power violence band that with prog influences, I got to be in a different headspace for that than mm -hmm. if I'm sitting down to do some way out a causal intrusion shit where i'm really pushing myself and it's very mm -hmm. uh through composed like a causal intrusion I, I sit there for like four or five hours and just work out a song and i don't mm -hmm. stop till it's like I don't, i'm not putting it on hold i'm not um waiting till the next day like i'm fucking and if it's not working out i'll put it down and i'll come back to it the next day but mm -hmm. it's kind of just like a lot of times it comes out right away like i'm just working through these riffs i'm I'm, I'm channeling them into each other and uh you know it's all it's all flowing perfectly sometimes it's it's easy boom song's ready you know sometimes it's a struggle and i have to put it down and come back to it whereas other times there's bands where i'm playing with a lot of other people who are helping composing so i'll have a random riff i remember kind of like you were referring to they'll have a random riff and um i kind of have a big picture in mind where i know how to fit the pieces together pretty well and uh, some of my favorite use of that outlook is when the album's done and putting the whole album together, picking that song order, creating mm -hmm. those little bridges and those uh, interludes. I mean, I love that stuff. Creating, to me, the full album experience is so important. Mm -hmm. And it's something oh, yeah. a lot of these kids today miss out on because they got the Spotify and the dumb, you know, that is, bouncing that is, that is, from song to song. That is a dying you know. art album uh, track order and an album experience is a sadly dying art. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just, it's, everything is playlists. So yeah. kids, kids don't listen to full albums. The kids nope. uh, don't listen to full albums. So it's like, that's why everything has to feel like on the business side of things, like it's a single and it can stand alone by itself, which is, right. I mean, it's a story. The whole album is a story and I want to write a it story or, or be a contributor to writing this story. You know, and the well, what the benefit we can get from that is saying, all right, we got to make every song fucking good. The banger, you know. I, I got to bring it on every song. I can't mm -hmm. have the album lull out a bit, you know, because mm -hmm. they might that might be the only song they hear, and they say, man, fuck this band, they suck. Yeah. You know, <laughs> when they don't see the big picture of I became in so hard on songs mm -hmm. one through three, I did an interlude, kind of had a little weaker track, and then I ramped it way back up on mm -hmm. seven through 10, you know, they don't see that. They just hear the single and say, oh, that was weak. Mm -hmm. So it, for me to rather than live in the negative and look at the positive, all right, now I got to bring it hard on every song. You know, mm -hmm. I can't 
I can't sit here uh, twiddling away on a clean intro for too long because they're going to lose their interest, right. which, in fact, it pushes me to to think outside my comfort zone, you know? Yeah. Because me, I like my Pink Floyd and my long, clean intros and my psychedelic bullshit, but I know today's world's not that anymore, and maybe I can pull a disembowelment and throw it in the middle of the song when they're already hooked. Or maybe mm -hmm. I can, you know, throw it later in the album. But, yeah, it's, a, it's very interesting to see how society and music has had to uh, regress or progress to, you know, uh, fit with the culture, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. great. Um, yeah, Mouse Bong said you can't even listen to a band or an album and that whole experience. And that's how I do. I want to listen to the whole thing. I didn't. Um, I wanted to share a book with one of my favorite uh, engineers, producer, uh, Rick Root. It, I got it in North Carolina a ago, and he has this book is freaking amazing. It's exactly, it's a, exactly what we're talking. About. The creative process, not forcing, but like be a really original. How do you make good voice and not force it? Make it too sterile or forced. And he's got a, I mean, he's, every chapter got a little quote in there before he does like a couple, two, three pages, 10 pages. And there's one I wanted to share with you. The book is called The Creative Act, A Way of Being. It's by Rick Rubin, produced the Danzig first album. Uh, mm. first South Love Atlanta. the first Danzig records mm -hmm. to this day. Yeah, he's outstanding. But his quote, like, this book is so inspiring for me. I know you guys would like it, too. Uh, the ability to look deeply is the root of creativity. To see past the ordinary mundane and get my otherwise invisible. He, he has stuff like this, too, and he just breaks it down. Like, the way I've always kind of felt when I think about being creative and coming to something new, he put it down into words, like, perfectly throughout in so many different ways to think about it. But I highly recommend uh, this Rick Rubin book. A uh, really good one. So that's that's going to segue. We want to wrap up in maybe 10 minutes. I want to talk about who's really pushing it for you guys. I want to throw out a fraud of, of right off the bat. Um, but And then I want to get your ideas on this. So Nightmare is one that came out here. Yeah. The death metal side. Uh, it's the old one of the old vocalists for Gigon. Mm -hmm. Um that this album was outstanding. Really enjoy this album. Nothingness is another one more on the death metal side, but definitely really good. Really love that one here. The Crin is one they're more like kind of this came out like 2009, maybe 2010. They're out of Minnesota. Still together. They put out a couple more albums, but this one is outstanding. Um, I have, I have, oh, I've ordered the vinyl for Pantheism, which is a puzzle. And I have uh, this one as well. These are all three of their albums, and these are Nick's albums, are outstanding. He's done one per for the last three years. Just an amazing creative uh, person. Fanta Facts, uh, Hive Mind Theory. Mm -hmm. uh, this came, Hive Mind Narcosis. This came out last year. Really bizarre. Like, this is really new. Um, and then, uh, album of the year for last year, which was just behind uh, Panpsychism, Parasite, was Mithridatum. These are guys from uh, mm -hmm. Facelifts. This mm -hmm. is an amazing, and more on the black metal side. Well, uh, there's a lot of kind of death spell omega. In it. Let me read uh, what uh, Tyler's talking about here. You guys got me through the pandemic with Bring Back the Play. There is not one song I don't love them, that I don't like. I love That's for you, Josh. Cool. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so who, who's really pushing things? This is my, this A Causal and Truth and Pantafax, the new Ahab I thought was really 
really beautiful, clean vocals and some clean spots where they change things up and then get really heavy in with the funeral doom. But what do you guys have? Uh, there's only, I, I always say like, I put up, like I put on like, I was telling you, I put on like those kind of lo-fi black metal stuff. That's what I like play while I'm cooking. Sometimes I'll have them on a speaker. Uh, but as far as like stuff that I like sit down, like, okay, I really want to listen to this. I search this out. Um, there's a band, I think they've probably been around for about 10 years now. Uh, it's, they're called Arcton. Mm, I don't and know. They were on uh, Fallen Empire Records, which kind of dissolved. And now I think, I want to say, oh, I, shoot. I, I don't remember what label they're on now. They moved to a different label. But either way, it's like an international collaboration. Um, uh, there's, of course, no band members listed. You know, you don't know who they are. I mean, if you do enough research, you can find out, oh, well, this guy was in Void Hanger. This guy was in Mar. This guy was in whatever. But they basically release records that are. Uh, about 40 minutes long. There's one song that's the conventional kind of music part of it that's 20 minutes, 20 plus minutes. And then there's <laughs> another 20 minute song that's all ambient music. And it's their same consistent um, way they lay things out. And the music portion is like at least the artwork is very sort of cosmic themed. There's mm -hmm. like, you know, the cover's like, oh, here's this nebula and here's, you know, some sort of, you know, they're all digital mashup artwork or whatever. But sort of cosmic sort of theme. Lyrically, I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, but the music is just, yeah, it's very like, just so just intense. It becomes this sort of like giant wave of just like double kicks and atmospheric guitar and, you know, screech, you know, various vocal styles and everything. And then we'll hit little ruts where it's like little, like more little delicate passages then it goes back. So it's almost like mm -hmm. if you're looking at the wave patterns, it's like, so it's like almost suffocatingly like just beautifully oppressive and then you have this ambient track to listen to afterwards and it seems like yeah they have a theme that's sort of thing it gets repetitive but i love that band like i i don't know how i think it's more of their form that's more avant-garde than like be the music being that strong key or crazy or whatever like that it's just right. it's so like sort of futuristic um and it's like a it's like a capsule that you're getting that was like you'd find on a future civilization <laughs> you know it's just this kind of cool stuff so that's all i have right now and and, and who is that again josh arkton a a r k h t i n n okay they just put out a record uh last year this is okay. the most recent one yeah definitely check that so that reminds me of exactly a band I'm thinking of the last, and that's actually the last LP I bought because uh, it's a really weird black metal band I discovered like three, four years ago called Mar, M-A-H-R. Yeah, it's part uh, of the same, the yeah. same, uh, oh, same, like, yeah, so. same guys, it's Voidhanger, uh, the band Voidhanger, Mar, and they, those two, a couple of those people plus others are. Oh, cool. Different. So yeah, I'm yeah. sure it's very similar, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, they just I I got hooked on them a few years ago for that just totally cavernous but also well composed and it's just this the atmosphere is so heavy and uh disturbing, you know, it really hooked me in. And yeah, the it's really the exact same thing you were saying with the dynamics and the structures, but um I saw Mar came out with a new record which was only two songs, mm -hmm. two twenty minute songs. Yeah. Um, but they're both pretty heavy with with lighter passages, so they don't mm -hmm. do the ambient thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I had to snatch that up right away. I mean, they're creating a unique spin on black metal that's people do the cavernous thing, people do the oppressive thing, but just the way they execute it is so different. Um, it's so different that no one else could do that. Mm -hmm. And really, that's what I think makes us makes a good musician a good musician is we do something no one else can do mm -hmm. you know anyone can put in the time and learn to shred but there's certain things we do that no one else can play you know whether it's the way we attack the strings or the way we we do certain phrasings or mm -hmm. you know the way we compose a song it's what what the unique things about us that make us a good musician and then going back the last show i went to down here uh was Thant uh, Thantific Seth and Sunless, and 
just the fact those two bands fucking I couldn't believe the Thanta I don't even know how to say it, but they pulled out they pulled off their album a hundred percent live. Wow. And like they were doing some insane shit on that album that it really blew. First time my mind's been blown in a while because we've all gone so far the Disney route already. It's kind of hard to blow my mind, you know. It's like, oh, uh, that's kind of cool. Oh, that's kind of cool. But they came and did some time bending shit with, you know, and and literal pitch bending and time bending and time warping shit that uh, I haven't heard anyone else do. It fucking blew my mind and. They pull it off live like nothing. Wow. Three fucking guys. Three guys. A guitar, bass, and drums. That's it. What, you know, that, and was that in a uh, brick, by, brick by Brick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there. Oh, okay. Uh, cool. yeah. yeah, and then uh, Sunless is his classic Gorgas worship, but they take it to a jazzier level and a faster level and uh, a more technical level that I just love. But, um, it's really just I suck getting put on the spot with this because I've I mean I have so many records I'm always listening to new shit and um, there's always shit blowing my mind just depending what mood I'm in but um, on the black metal side of things I'm gonna be releasing this one album that's total I mean I didn't do it I'm releasing it on my label totally out there synth only black metal which is almost combining like the coldest of almost techno with these horrific black metal vocals over it, and yeah, I thought that it's, it's not dungeon synth. It's totally <laughs> colder. It's colder. It's uh more abrasive, but then it also goes into like post punk calmer territory. Uh -huh. I mean, it's three fucking songs, but what this guy did, you can tell he's in isolation in the sense it's so far removed from anything that's been done. He's just taking what he likes of something and another. And with his own uniqueness, and uh, I'm really excited to get that out. Um, so, should be in the next month or two. I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, awesome. I didn't announce is that uh, Nick is the founder of Malala Town. So, he's putting out a podcast right now. Yeah, and I'm blessed that it's kind of on its own, just turned into all these weird black metal guys hitting me up. So, <laughs> I'm not complaining, you know. But I'm pretty much just going to put out whatever the fuck I want, whether it's free jazz or death metal, weird black metal. As long as it's weird, that's my only stipulation mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, it has to fucking uh, sound different to me. And then selfishly put out my own shit whenever I feel like it, too. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. All right. Well, um, so I think we're about done. We could go on and on. Uh, but I, I just wanted to give you guys a... I'm sure everybody listening in more Grotland would like to hear what you guys have going on. I know, Josh, you have a big tour coming up, the big decibel tour uh, coming up uh, this April or May. I think it's April or May. Yeah, we what we have in March, we have, we're in Europe here uh, after a month uh, with, uh, was it? Uh, oh, Signs of the Swarm and Tour of the Stab Wounds and Vomit Forth. And then um, in the U.S. Uh, in May we're doing uh, Chaos and Carnage, which yeah. we just announced. So that's but that's the last thing, you know, we have booked for 2024. So maybe something in the fall, wherever whatever territory that's in. But um, we've been fairly busy. We have a little time off, like we are finished our last tour right before the holidays, and then uh, got like a month and a half or so off. So we're kind of trying to regain our sanity, and then. We're going to do those tours and probably start writing again. Yeah. Um, nice. You notice that your crowd size is getting bigger. I mean, the merch line at your shows, it, it never stopped. For for every freaking that was up, I saw you guys with the We're, dark black. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The and yeah, your, de decibel last year. Yeah, your merch, was, your merch line was going the entire night. And We're, fortunate that our like our our like singer does a lot of like designing and collaborating with uh, artists and some some designs are his own too um that he's just really savvy about getting good looking merch out there yeah right so it's, yeah but have you noticed your crowd side being bigger and because it seems to me like when you guys got on people more about you than dark funeral 
Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, I feel very fortunate that, or we feel very fortunate that there's been a very good, steady upward trajectory of attendance. Um, this, the tour we just did that we just finished with uh, uh, Sing Sudabog and um, Immolation um, and Cast Trigger, uh, that was great. That was probably, I would say, I would, I would almost say the best tour we've ever done. Like uh, headlining wise, like a standard tour that wasn't like, oh, you're doing these crazy fests here and there. It yeah. was probably the best tour we've done, especially as you mentioned, it's like attendance wise. Yeah. Uh, it was the best number. You know, I hate it sounds douchey to use these terms, but the best numbers we've ever done. You yeah. know, so uh, it it's definitely you know we just kind of try to maintain, <laughs> keep people's attention and everything, and just try to keep putting out the best stuff we can. You know, and hopefully people will stick around for it. All right, Nick. What in like four different projects at all? Levelant Sound Rec. Is there um, one on at the moment? So newest on the horizon. I just put up uh, the pre-order for the newest "Nothing Is Real" album, which is my solo kind of progressive doom project, and extremely happy with. Uh, I you know I am actually satisfied with this record, which is tough for me, and um, I really feel like I've pushed it push the sound to something much more mature and uh, monolithic kind of biblical sounding doom shit uh, with plenty of weird noise rock and weird time signatures and frog shit in there. All the good things I like and consolidate it to a nice 44 minutes, which is tough for me too, but I've been uh, learning to really like what we were talking about with the new culture and the attention span really, um, hone the best of what I'm working on and put it, you know, and it's like kind of like when we see a show, right? Would you rather see a great 20 minute set or a shitty two hour set? You know, I'd rather see a great 20 minute set. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. I'm extremely happy with that. That pre-order is up on Bandcamp. And then um, I'm uh, just about finished up with the new Dwelling Below record, which is my band out on Transcending Obscurity. And um, that's fully improvised death doom. I get together with my guys out in uh, Mississippi, Louisiana area. One of my main drummers lives out there, and uh, bassist lives out there too. And we just join up and we fucking go for it. And we've all played together so much that it comes out fucking phenomenal every time. And then I take those raw tracks home and I build on it with extra guitars and leads and stuff. Um, so the second album I feel is much better than the first, just from our maturity playing together and then um uh what's it called transcending obscurity is also going to put out another record of ours um which is all composed and we worked hard on called hierarchies and it's total gore guts uh worship but even weirder even more even less gain the lowest gain i've gone yet and just totally bizarre uh avant-garde jazz mixed with death metal and uh I'm fucking totally, he's playing some crazy fretless bass shit and uh, it really just came out fucking great. So, um, so yeah. And then also I'm working on, on, I'm about finished. I decided to go ahead and do a uh, post punk goth dark wave album. Mm. And uh, I did all, yeah, I'm fucking, it was so much fucking fun. And uh, I played with my drummer from a cause that we played with all the time, but he was able to play so tight. Like he's a drum machine. You know, and uh, I'm doing crazy, uh, clean chorus, washed out guitars, mm -hmm. and threw some Juno synths in there, and really mm -hmm. just nailed the fucking vibe. And that's another genre that was extremely helpful for me because it's all about simplicity. Mm -hmm. And you know me, I'm a busy guy. I like to throw everything at the wall. This I had to fucking calm it way down. Say this is the riff. This works. Don't over. Don't add all these layers. You know, it's all about sparseness and simplicity. So you get the trippy washed out guitar, the sad riffs, you get the driving bass line, the dun 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 dun, and then you get the washy synths, and then you're done. Don't mm -hmm. keep fucking with it. And that's an important lesson for me to learn is when to stop fucking with it. So mm -hmm. that's a few things I got on the horizon. Um, got a tour, getting panned out. We're finishing up an album first, getting an LP release, and then. Um, but I'm playing with, I don't know if you guys have heard of Man is the Bastard. It's an old. Oh, uh, absolutely. 
Airport. Yes, I'm playing with the drummer. Um, we have a oh, new incarnation cool. called Bastard Collective. Okay. And it's and it's all new songs. We play a couple of their old songs, but um, it's kind of it's me. It's my one of my old buddies on bass. It's uh, the original drummer of Man Is a Bastard. Mm -hmm. Some of their original guys doing the noise machines, and then we're bringing mm -hmm. in some uh, saxophone in the mix, and uh, kind of just going a little more proggy with it, a little more longer and intense composition so we're about i'm engineering that whole album it's about done and uh as soon as that lp's out we'll probably hit a little tour so i'll, I'll let you oh, guys that's know sick. cool yeah, yeah yeah that'd be great yeah well guys just outstanding i think we've discussed something that have seen on the internet for a, a long discussion Who's really put things creatively in metal? I, I, I'm so glad I took you to have on and thank you for your time coming in here. This has been amazing for me. I had so many comments out there. Just the guys said it was an uh, outstanding experience for her. It was for me. I will go back and I've written down all kinds of things you guys have talked about. Go listen to those now. Hope everyone else watching has done well. Love to have you guys. I'll think of some. Maybe we can get you on again. But uh, any parting words, how's the time? But, uh, thank you so much for your time. This has been John Moore and Nick Turner of Impossible Intrusion, five or six of uh, with us and Malevolence. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you guys. It's been a pleasure.